kick in. Picking up where we left off last week, Paul's going through all these things that are affecting the church and people's personal lives. It says, look carefully, pay attention, then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, asking what's the wise thing to do. Therefore, do not be foolish, that's the opposite of being wise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, when something's just clearly right, right or wrong, don't murder people, don't lie to people, don't steal from your neighbor. You don't have to ask what's the wise thing to do because those aren't gray areas. Follow me? We're just jumping right in. Here we go. But in an area where the Bible doesn't come right out and tell you exactly how to do something, that's where we have to train ourselves to ask what is the wise thing to do. What we don't want to ask are questions that we often ask, such as how far is too far, which at its heart is saying, is there anything wrong with blank? Please don't call me. I know sometimes you'll do it by accident. You'll call me and say, hey, pastor, would there be anything wrong if I did X, Y, Z? Because the first thing I'm going to do to say to you is, well, is that your goal in life to just not be wrong? Okay? Our goal in life is to be like Christ. You drag it with me? We don't, because whenever we say, is there anything wrong with, or how far is too far, really what we're saying is, how close can I get to sin without sinning? And so, in order to ask and said, what is the wise thing to do, whatever the situation is, what we talked about last week is putting guardrails up in your life to where you don't even get close to sinning, to where you're pursuing the heart of Christ. What does that look like? Try to discern, no matter what situation, if it's a gray area, we're going to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's the question we want to ask. You follow? Not how close can I get to sin? to sin without sinning, not is there anything wrong with, the question we want to ask is, in my current situation, what should I do, what would be best for me and for those around me, okay, what do I need to do that will be pleasing to the Lord, okay, that's what we're after, like, what can I do, what would be the most pleasing to the Lord in this situation, all right. And part of what he communicated as part of those guardrails when it comes to sexual immorality, but really anything in the church that could make the church look bad, okay, don't even let there be a hint. Don't even let there be named as something that might be happening with you. So that's one of the guardrails that we talked about for parenting into the grays. Life principles are caught, they're not taught. So moms and dads, I'm just going to ask you questions, grandmas and grandpas grandmas and grandpas when you want to teach the principle of self-control and let there may there not even be a hint of sexual immorality in my teenager's life okay how many of you want them to put guardrails in their lives to where they don't even get close to sinning they're going to have guardrails in their lives so they don't even get close so there's not even a hint of sexual immorality in their life how many of you as parents grandparents You don't want to even be a hint of sexual immorality in your child's life. Raise your hand if that's true of you. Okay, now teenagers, look around. Leave your hands up. If your parent didn't raise your hand just now, you can do whatever you want to do. They're not watching over you anymore. They just don't care. They're like, do whatever you want to do. I don't care. You can't embarrass me. All right? So, but for all the parents, the good parents that did raise their hands, here's what I want to say. Okay? When we say that life principles are caught, not taught, If I want my kids to learn to put parameters in their lives, to put guardrails, so not only do I not get close to sinning, but I put guardrails in my life so that I can do things that I know are pleasing to the Lord, then I need to model that in my own life. And the use of alcohol is one of those things. And I don't want to try to usurp your role as parents, and I don't want to come in and tell you, like a lot of times we can get to the point to where, Churches have done this in the past. Well, you can have one beer a week or two, or it's okay for this person. Like, that is the dumbest thing in the world. Say, well, you know, two drinks is the wine for all our church members, or no drinks, we're teetotalers. Like, never have any alcohol whatsoever. We do that, but, I mean, honestly, having two beers is different than a, per, a woman that weighs 105 pounds than a guy that weighs 235. Y- y'all understand that? So just to throw out a rule like there, that's just, that's kind of silly. 
what we're talking about is what guardrails do I need to put up in my life? Not just in the area of alcohol and sexual immorality. What guardrails do I need to put up in my life to where there's not even a hint of something that's not pleasing to the Lord? Okay? So th this is important to communicate. Now, as I do this biblical context, okay, I, I want to share this with you that it it's almost like spiritual malpractice. Um going back to even part of what we we're talking about last week like like follow follow this with me have you ever heard a pastor say something along the lines of back in biblical times women weren't respected have you ever heard something like that back in biblical times women weren't educated back in biblical times uh women weren't allowed to teach back in biblical times the people had to act this way Listen, whenever a pastor throws out a big blanket like that, like this is where we say in the South, I want you to think, God bless them. <laughs> you ever use that phrase about somebody that you care about, but they do stupid things? God bless them. I'm sure their heart's right, but they're an idiot. All right, so like I'm trying to find a nice way of saying these well-meaning pastors that just throw out a blanket. Here's what I want you to understand before I get into what I'm talking about this morning, okay? Don't say back in biblical times, because biblical times, if this Bible that you hold in your hand, it spans 8,000 years over people that lived in 100 different cultures on three different continents with hundreds of different languages. There's no blanket biblical times this was true. It doesn't exist. Some women were very educated. In some cultures, women were allowed to be in leadership. In some cultures, women were actually religious leaders and things. So when you ever hear say, well, Paul's saying this because in biblical times, blah, blah, blah. Ah, God bless them. Listen, it's not even the same. For Hebrew people, look at the differences from the time of Abraham to Hebrew people's lives at the time of Moses. From Moses to the time of Judges, completely different time, 150 years apart, right? From the Judges to the time of King David and King Solomon, nothing alike when they were wandering in the wilderness with, with Moses. The time of the prophets was completely different than the time of the exile. The time of the exile was completely different than the Jews living in the Holy Land at the time of the post-exile. The post-exile was completely different than the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. The time of Jesus was completely different than the time of David. The culture of Jesus was completely different than what Paul had to deal with when he went to these Greco-Roman cities. Do you all follow what I'm saying? So when somebody makes a general statement like, this is what alcohol was like in biblical times, times the question for you to say is what which biblical times like give me time date place context so when we try to pick up the bible and read a verse from deuteronomy and say that it's the same as the time of jesus they're not even close that's why it can be confusing moses right now this is true at the time of moses they sacrificed the demons the egyptians did that were no gods, and then they got out to the Canaanites, did the same thing. The gods they had never known, to new gods they had come to recently. And then Paul says it was also true, the, the Greco-Roman people, pagan sacrifice to demons, not to God. And he says, I don't want you to be anywhere close to those demons. Stay away from it. And the demon he's talking about is Dionysus. And Dionysus, the Greco-Roman god at, at the time of Paul, he was the god of wine, fertility, and theater, but the way they drank wine in Paul's time, listen to me, was not the same wine or the way they drank in the time of Moses. The way they drank wine in Ephesus was not even close to even the kind of wine that Jesus would have had when he was traveling with his disciples. So when we say, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, whether it's alcohol or any other area in our lives, just remember the context into which a statement is made. Time, place, people, continent, culture, language, all of these affect the way we understand these verses, okay? And this is what we understand. When he says, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, many times in order to understand what the will of the Lord is, we have to understand what the context of the people was. I'm going to say that again. And to understand, in order to understand what the will of the Lord is, and coming from his central passage 
we have to understand what the context of the people was into which the command was given. Now, the thing that supersedes all of this is the character of God. So this is a black-white issue that we left off with last week. Please understand this. When Paul says to the Ephesian people, do not get drunk with wine, for that is of, of Bacchus, debauchery. You're inviting the demon into your house when you do that, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? What is the characteristic of God, watch this, that he says is the opposite of being drunk with wine? Think about that. When you get drunk, what do you lose? And the answer to that is what? Control. Your mind, your sanity. Who, who is in more control than anybody else in the universe? God, right? So if we want, we want to have control of our faculties because God always has control of his faculties. God is always in his right mind, therefore we always want to be in our right mind. We want to be filled, that means led by the Spirit of God instead of being led by or filled with wine. Because if you fill yourself up with wine, you're not going to be in self-control like God is. You're going to be controlled by Bacchus. Bacchus is going to get his foot in the door, right? And this is how you knew in that culture, I'm going to say this now, in that culture when Paul's writing, when we're studying first century alcohol production, you can know how much control the demon Bacchus had in a community by how much alcohol they produced. In other words, if there were a million temples to Bacchus or Dionysus in a city, do you follow? That means those people produced and drank a lot of alcohol. If you go into a city in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, guess how many temples to Bacchus they had? The answer to that is what? Zero. In Galilee, guess how many temples to Bacchus they had? The answer to that is what? Zero. Like that demon didn't have much control there. They had their issues. It was the religious, the fake religious people that had demonic control at the time of Jesus. But it wasn't so much Bacchus. He wasn't the ruler there. But what he's saying is, man, in the Greco-Roman world, Bacchus had not only a foothold, man, he was in the room sitting at everybody's dining room table. And it was demonic, and everybody was willingly going to these temples and just saying, I need to lose control. And they drink and drink and drink and drink. That said, when it comes to alcohol, this is the question we want to ask. This is not a right-wrong issue. The right-wrong issue is don't get drunk. That's true of any culture, all times, all places, because it violates the character of God. Everybody with me? What is the right-wrong issue when it comes to alcohol? You've got to be in control. You can't lose control of your tongue, your faculties, your ability to drive. If you do that, if you're losing any kind of self-control, this is where we talked about last week, or if you are seeking emotional comfort through alcohol, then you are being unwise at best. And this is why there's a law of the land. It says buzz driving is drunk driving. What does that mean? You may not be drunk drunk, but if you're buzzed, you don't have, you've already lost some of your faculties. So what does this mean? If you drink to the point that you're getting buzzed, you've already started losing what? Some self-control. We don't even go there. Why? That's a guardrail. If I don't get buzzed, I won't get drunk. Okay? The other thing that we don't want to go to is run to the bottle for our personal comfort. Okay? And what we saw from last week is when people are stressed, they run to their gods. And they clearly did that during the time of COVID. We didn't know what was going to happen in the world. We didn't know how severe that, that virus was going to be. And alcohol sales just went through the roof all over the country. And what Jesus is communicating to us is he's not saying, and I want to make this clear, I do not believe for a second that Jesus would say to us, you can never have a drink of alcohol. Now, it's a black-white issue. I'm just going to say this right now. I've got a lot of students in here listening to what I'm about to say. It's a black-white issue that we should never get drunk. But it's also a black-white issue, right-wrong issue, right, uh, in that we should follow the laws of the land. So if you're under 21, you don't need to worry about any of this. You don't need to be drinking at all. Now, if you're a teenager this morning and you're saying, but what if I go to Mexico where the drinking age is 18? Can I go to Europe over spring break 
and then God would be okay with it, what is at the heart of that question? How close can I get to sin without sinning? You're not asking what would be pleasing to the Lord. You're being a legalist. Everybody follow that? And that is not what we want in this church. That's what the Pharisees were. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm not saying you can never have a drink. Please understand that. I'm not saying you can't have a beer with your dinner. Please understand that. But what I am trying to communicate is how do we wisely interact with alcohol? Jesus says this. It's not wise if you're going to alcohol for any kind of comfort. He says, if you're struggling, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Alcohol might give you rest and a night's sleep, but you're going to wake up in the morning with the same emotional, spiritual problems. The last time, this is where we left off last week, the last time you need to take a drink is the last time when you need to take a drink. Any. I just want to encourage you with this. Listen to what I'm saying. If you ever feel like, man, I need a drink so I can relax, you've got a problem. Anytime you say you need alcohol, it's already a sign you've got a problem. Okay? You don't need it. It's okay to have it, but you don't need it. What you need is Jesus. And man, uh, uh, my, my friendship, Dodd's got a book. Uh, about addiction, and if there's something you're struggling with, man, there, I could do a whole sermon on that, he could do a whole sermon on that. But if you're struggling with any type of substance abuse, feeling like, hey, I need this, need whatever, I gotta have it, and it's not God, then this would be a great book for you to for you read. All right, so I gotta continue. When we talk about biblical context, and we read verses in the Bible about alcohol, it can be a lot like, depending on what time period in history that that portion of scripture was written okay it can be a lot like trying to describe an elephant if you've only got this block to look at now can you imagine this person is all they know about an elephant is what they're seeing here and they tell this person down here i'm going to describe an elephant to you it has huge ivory tusks that stick out like six feet long right here and this person who's like i don't have any idea what you're talking about ivory tusks i just know elephants have really big toenails and then this person here says, you know what, I don't know what y'all are looking at, but it, an elephant has the biggest ears of everything I've seen in my life, okay? Bigger than Richard Nixon. I mean, it's unbelievable, okay? So, uh, so here's what I'm saying is when you, when you look at different perspectives, and that's what the writers of scriptures do, they are speaking into a local context from the context of their community they are immersed in that, and our immediate, listen, our immediate culture, our context is like we're a bunch of fish swimming in that ocean. We, that's all we know is our context unless we get to know someone else's situation. So today I'm continuing, and we're going to run through this quickly in the next 30 minutes. So I just need you to hop on the horse and stay with me. Remember, God and Jesus, that's God the Father and his son. Satan, Zeus, had a son. His name was Dionysus. And Zeus wanted the world to find their joy through the God of wine. And God the Father wanted the world to find their joy through Jesus the Son. Okay? Now, who are we going to follow? Round two. And this is the only round. It's going to be a knockout. All right? Uh, when we talk about alcohol use and biblical contextualization, let's remember that Moses, when he's writing about our alcohol in the wilderness, is going to be completely different than the time of Solomon in his time of plenty. They're both Hebrew people, they both speak Hebrew, but a completely different context. What do I mean by that? When the Hebrew people were moving around every two weeks, wandering the desert for 40 years, do you think Moses had a wine cellar? The answer to that is what? No, absolutely not. Like the way they would use alcohol or fermented grapes when they were out there, did they even have a vineyard regularly? That They, they didn't stay anywhere long enough to grow a vineyard. Do you? You follow what I'm saying? Their understanding of alcohol is going to be completely different because they were just living hand to mouth with manna every day. But Moses is going to guide them. When they go into Canaan, he's going to say, it's going to be a little bit similar to what you came out of in Egypt. But by the time we get to Solomon, like Solomon's the richest man in the world. How many of you know Solomon had a bunch of vineyards in which he made a bunch of wine? Were you all aware of that? Don't you think Solomon had some really nice wine cellars? 
So his grape juice that he keeps around for a, a few months or a good year, like Solomon knows something about wine and good wine because rich people have that ability to have some really good stuff because they can store it away for a while. But when we go to Jesus and we talk about impoverished Israel at the time, people living like peasants, how many times do you think when Jesus is speaking of drinking wine with his disciples, how many, of you, how many times do you think in 38 A.D., that uh, Jesus said to Peter, uh, hey, Peter, why don't you run down to our disciple wine cellar and get something from the year, I don't know, 17 A.D.? That was a really good year. How many times do you think Jesus had that conversation with them? The answer to that is what? Zero. Where? Like, they didn't go around all the time with a bunch of wine sacks on their back saying, oh, if we just carry these around three more years, it'll make for a really good fermentation process. Like, once they got the grape juice, it might have stuck around a little bit, but how long, how, do you really think that Peter, James, and John, those bunch of 20-year-olds, do you really think they waited eight months carrying wine on their back so they could have some well-aged wine? How many times do you think that happened? None. I'm going to show you more specifically about that in a moment. But then on the other hand, when you talk about Paul and the opulence that came with the Greco-Roman culture, man, they had alcohol like nobody in the world had alcohol. And when you look into places like Ephesus, Corinth, Rome, they had dozens of temples to Bacchus. Dozens of places that produced alcohol or people went to to drink alcohol. That's how you know that Bacchus had a foothold in those cultures is because there were all these places that made alcohol and you could drink alcohol in it. Bacchus was a major influence there. And so when Moses writes to people, I want you to understand context here, okay? When he says to the people of Israel, when you go into the promised land and you're taking a week of vacation so you can celebrate the Lord in our religious holidays, watch what he says. He says, take this money that you've saved up for your vacation, for your religious holidays. They were one and the same for them. Spend the money however you desire. Steak, lamb, or what does he tell them to do? You can spend money on wine. But understand this about wine at Moses' time. It was only 3% alcohol by volume. And if you want to know how I came to those numbers, next Sunday night, we're doing last Sunday seminary a week early. I can tell you how we can know really close that it was only about 2 to 3%. Or he says strong drink, which they had the ability in Egypt to make beer. And if they knew how to make it in Egypt, it probably made its way to Canaan land. Do you understand what I'm saying? But that would have been, their strongest drinks were 5%. But he says this, it's okay to have a glass of wine. It's a, and if you're fundamentalist, drink, raise King James only, please don't leave the church. I'm just telling you context. Please, what Moses is saying, you can have a glass of wine and you can have a beer. That was their strong drink. You can have whatever your appetite craves, but when you do it, what has to be the attitude of your heart? Not, I need a break. Not, I need relaxation. Not, I need escape. Not, I need to vacate. It's what? Why do I eat and drink? It's so that I can rejoice because of the generosity of God in my life. Everybody follow that? Solomon writes this. Now, this is a guy who knew something about stronger drink. He said, he's telling his son this in his older years. He says, son, now be wise when it comes to alcohol. Direct your heart in the way. I'm going to give you some wisdom here. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. And slumber will clothe them with rags. Do you remember what Paul said earlier about what anger leads to, about what sexual immorality leads to? We talked about that. This is what he's communicating here. Abuse of alcohol is going to lead to things you don't want. It's going to lead to poverty. It's going to lead to rags. It's going to lead to you being passed out and lazy. That's what it leads to. It's, who has woe? It's going to lead to, what's what he's saying? It's going to lead to woe. Alcohol abuse is going to lead to sorrow. Alcohol abuse is going to lead to strife. Alcohol abuse is going to lead to complaining fights among the brothers i love this one who has wounds without cause don't raise your hand on this but if you ever had too much to drink and you wake up the next morning you got bruises and somebody asked you where did you get those bruises and your answer was i don't know 
That's what happens when you have too much drink when you're in college, but I wouldn't know anything about that. All right? Who has redness of eyes? This is what alcohol abuse leads to, okay? How does it lead to it? It's not just having a drink. That's not what's wrong. Solomon says, here's wisdom. It's those who tarry long over wine. In other words, those who have too much. Too much of what? This 3% of wine. Or those who go to try mixed wine. Mixed wine means it was mixed with water, which was at least half or less, maybe even 1%. And that's the type of wine that Jesus would have had. It would have been probably about 1.5% to 3% alcohol by volume. Just biblical contextualization. That's what alcohol was in the day. And so this is what Solomon is telling in his son about how to deal with alcohol, what wisdom is. Don't gaze at it. In other words, don't focus on that. Don't long for it. Don't, if you're waking up in the morning saying, I've got to have a drink, this is not healthy for you. Don't gaze at it. Don't focus on it when it's right there and when it's sparkling in the cup and that it goes down smoothly. That's what makes a good drink, right, that it goes down smooth. He says, I'm warning you, son, in the end it's going to bite like a serpent and it's going to sting you like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. And this is why, have you ever heard the country song uh, that said, have you ever heard, This is where I just got to watch how I word things. So D doesn't say, watch how you word things. Here it comes. We heard the country song that says, last night at 10 o'clock, I thought she was a two. But somehow by 2 a.m., she turned into a 10. Or last night at 2, I went home with a 10, and I woke up at 10 with a two. Have you ever heard that expression before? Like you look at some guy and you're like, man, that guy's not very attractive at all. He's a two. You get about four beers in you, all of a sudden, man, he's Brad Pitt. Man, your eyes are seeing some strange things. You're like, man, that's ugly. I wouldn't even touch that guy. And four hours and four beers later or maybe four beers and one hour later, like all of a sudden you're out on the dance floor having a good time. Like, dude, dude, what are you looking at? And then the other one is your heart will utter perverse things. Man, don't raise your hand, but I mean, how many of us have had one drink too many and you said something that you, you just look back on and you're like, why did I ever say that? And this is what Solomon is warning his son about. He said, man, you're going to end up like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of the mast. You're like, oh, this is how you're going to end up. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I didn't feel it. When shall I wake? Why didn't you feel it? Because you were passed out in your dorm room. This is where it's going to lead. But then when you wake up in the morning, Solomon warns his son, this is how you're going to wake up the next morning. I must have another drink. And my friends, that's when we got to watch out. Is when you say, man, when I'm on vacation, I must have a drink. When, I, when it's 5 o'clock somewhere, I must have a drink. It's dangerous. Now, we go to the time of Jesus. When he turned water into wine, usually what they were serving was the 1.5%, and he gave them the 3%. But please understand this, that when we're talking about alcohol use and biblical con- contextualization, at the time of Paul, watch, his wine was 3%. That would have been the best wine that Jesus made. But they also had 6% beer, okay? But I want you to see in our modern contextualization, when people say, oh, yeah, but Jesus drank wine. Oh, yeah, but Paul would have had a drink of wine. Or Moses said that they could have a strong drink. Listen to what they're saying. I want you to understand the context. Our wine today, on average, runs 12% alcohol by volume. The time of Jesus and Paul, the best wine was 3% alcohol by volume. What does that mean? One glass of wine today equaled how many glasses of wine back then? Four. That's great Tennessee math. Great job, everybody. Y'all follow that? So if you hear, man, Jesus would have had four or five glasses of wine with their Passover dinner. That's true. Contextualization, though, it would be the equivalent of one to at most two glasses of wine with our wine today. Everybody follow what I'm saying? When we're talking about strong drink that Moses had, that 6% alcohol by volume, 
That's the same as our beer today, pretty much. Okay? So in other words, Moses says, if you want to have a beer with dinner, you can have a beer with dinner. It's when you start drinking four or five beers. And depending on your weight and your size and your just countenance, like maybe one's all you need to have. And when we talk about drinking hard liquor, that old Tennessee whiskey, right? That's not in the Bible. Jack Daniels is not in Ephesians chapter 5. Y'all understand that? There ain't no Jim Beam in the Word of God. I could go on, but I won't. All right. This is what we just find contextualization today that alcohol use leads to. And when I say contextualization, the stats I'm about to give you are true for people who have more than two drinks a week. I'm not saying they drink two times a week. I'm saying these stats I'm about to give you are true for those who have two or more drinks a week. Okay? Aren't my stats. It's from the National Institute of Health. I can give these exact ones to you if you want to look them up sometime. I'll give them to you next Sunday night. People who drink regularly like this are people who tend to be involved in domestic abuse more often. They tend to be a part or be associated with physical assaults far more often than those who don't drink regularly. They tend to more often be raped or to rape. And I, I'm just going to speak to you the pastor. You know the, the men, I'm going to pastor you right now. I have probably counseled them. This is why I'm saying open up your hearts, be real with me. I'm not going to name any names. I would never do something like that, but I just want you to know. like people, Sometimes if adultery happens in a relationship, people think, oh, my goodness, this never happens to Christians. Let me tell you, over the years, I've counseled more than 100 couples, Christians, active church members, who've had adultery affect their relationship, their marriage. Okay? And I loved every single one of them, and all of them would tell you still that I, lo I loved them, and I never told anybody else about what was going on. That said, of those hundred couples that had an adulterous affair, do you know how many of them, when I asked them, was alcohol involved when you were doing this sinful thing? Do you know how those hundred of couples that cheated, do you know how many of them never drank during that process? Out of a hundred people who cheated, do you know how many of them didn't drink during that process? You know what the answer is? Zero. In every adulterous situation, the person was drinking at least two drinks a week. I'm, I'm just here to tell you, it's what he says. This is what it leads to. I don't want to see any of you go through that pain. As far as health effects go, people who have two or more drinks a week have a much higher rate of heart arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, stroke, heart failure, short-term and long-term memory loss, cirrhosis of the liver, eye disease, hepatitis, pancreatitis, kidney disease, kidney failure, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. Man, when you let that demon in the door as a regular part of your life, you're asking for trouble. And I even had a family that said, hey, share this with the church today. We have a member of our congregation, like drinking can lead to DUIs and DUIs can lead to trouble. And this week in our congregation, someone is having another surgery this week to fix something as a result of a DUI 17 years ago. That is the gift, my friends, that keeps on giving that DUI. And nobody thinks when they sit down to that first drink, I'm going to get a DUI and hurt a family of four tonight. Nobody thinks I'm going to end up losing my license sometime this evening. Just be wise. I'm not saying you can't have a drink. I'm saying you please be wise. I want to put this in Tennessee contextualization. Remember when I said earlier you can know how much influence Bacchus had on a culture by how much they produce and how much their people drink? In the South, do you understand this about Tennessee? 
that there's only one other state in the South that produces more alcohol than we do. When you look on TripAdvisor, the number two thing for people to do, okay, I mean, one out of four things that people do for fun in Tennessee go back to alcohol production. Some of you might be thinking, I thought it was one out of one. I mean, it's just, if you go to East Tennessee, the number one tourist attraction isn't Dollywood. Five of the 12 top attractions in East Tennessee are alcohol-producing companies. They get more visits than Dolly Parton does. How much, this is what I want to say to you, in the same way Paul was saying to Ephesus and Corinth and Rome, man, you got to look up, like, Bacchus has a foothold there. I'm here to share with you, my friends. Every stat tells us Bacchus has a foothold in Tennessee like no other state in the South except for one. Do you know who number one is? Thank God for Kentucky and the Bourbon Trail, right? Kentucky takes it to a whole nother level. I ain't preaching there this week, so I'm going to keep going, okay? Just facts. These These aren't fundamentalist church facts. These are National Institute of Health. These are Harvard studies. One out of two people who drink alcohol have a genetic predisposition toward addiction. One out of two. One out of six people who drink more than two drinks a week will end up as functional alcoholics. What I'm saying is it won't necessarily destroy their lives, but it will affect their lives. They will have to have those drinks to function normally. One out of 10 people in the United States who drink alcohol will have serious negative effects, life negative, life altering events as a result of their alcohol use. Don't forget these. So when we're talking about what's the wise thing to do, just remember even this, that's Russian roulette. And most of us wouldn't play. See, what Paul says to the Corinthians when it comes to having a drink, he's not saying they can't have a drink. This is what he's saying. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And what he's trying to get them to see, and what I'm saying what God would want us to see, is just because you can doesn't mean you should have more than two drinks a week. Just because you can every week doesn't mean you should every week. And then Paul switches the message here. And here's where I'm making a right turn, and I need y'all to follow with me with this. It's really important. Paul says, listen, you might be able to handle alcohol, but let no Christian seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. In other words, don't just consider, don't just consider what you can handle. Consider that one out of two person that can't. He says to the church at Rome, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Again, he says to the church at Ephesus, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up. And that's the theme over and over, is only do things that help other people, do things that are helpful, not hurtful. And so when you introduce someone to alcohol, just think this question. Is this helpful to them? Or could it very likely be hurtful? Paul says to the church in Philippi, do nothing from selfish ambition. Some of you even right now, you're like, I don't have a problem with this. I can do whatever I want. This is what he's saying to the church that was saying that very thing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Have you ever heard the family acronym, forget about me, I love you? This is what I'm asking of you, church family. To forget about yourselves and love your neighbor. Be wise in your use of alcohol, but even more wise in how it affects the people around you. And this is what I want to share to you. Now I'm getting into the nitty-gritty. Are you ready for this? 
I want to share with you, now that I've had, I've had over a dozen people in the last two or three weeks come and say, hey, here I am. Here are my struggles. And the, I even have one in particular say, I used to be at another church, but I, had, I, I got sober. I started going back to another church in town, but when I went to their small group activity, guess what's the first thing they offered me when I went over to my friend's house? And do you think the people in the small group thought, I'm doing harm by putting this in this person's hand? And it was this person's small group that led to their drunkenness again. Man, listen, I don't want to be known as the church in town that gets people back in their life of addiction. And I want to say this as a pastor. Another family told me this, like, they're willing to share in very small circles what their history is, but they don't want their kids to know what their struggle has been in recent years. And in many ways, they're very wise for that. Do you understand? Like, there are some things that your kids don't need to know right now. And so in order to guard their children, they're not going to share with small group. Well, I don't think anybody in my small group has a problem. They're not going to tell you. And it probably takes two or three years before they'll even share with their pastor. Do you all follow what I'm saying? And our society has shamed people and shamed people. And what I'm here to share with you this morning is, listen, we all have our struggles. We all have our fights. Don't let the devil, don't let the world, don't even let the church shame you for what you're coming out of. Listen, it's our job to lead people to be more like Jesus, what they're heading toward. Nobody here is going to shame you for what you came out of. We want to love you to where Jesus wants you to go next. Y'all follow me? But that being said, it would not be the wise thing for them to do for their family's sake, to go and tell everybody. So you might be on a small group outing and you think none of us here have a problem. What I'm telling you, friends, and people have told me, and it's even happened here, you don't know what they're struggling with. And then, even worse than that, is you're at something, a church event especially, and someone has a beer, and then you say, no, I don't want to have one. And then two minutes later, somebody else comes up to you and says, hey, why aren't you drinking? What other drug do you have to explain to somebody that you're not taking with them at a party? Do y'all follow what I'm saying? You might be able to have that drink. One out of two people shouldn't. Consider your neighbor. So very quickly, I want to give you seven takeaways that I'm going to ask as your pastor, as your elder overseer, and as someone who's teaching you the wisdom of God's word, here's seven things I'm going to ask you to do. Some for your own good, but some for the good of your neighbor. I'm just, I'm, I'm begging you, please. Here they are. Number one, okay, this is it. This is right or wrong. Never should this happen. Let's never, not one member here, ever get drunk. And it, again, if you're saying, well, I don't get drunk with, drunk with wine, I get drunk with hard liquor. Like, again... You're missing the point. I never get drunk on wine. I only like beer. You're missing the point. Don't lose control. For that is of Bacchus. It's not safe. That's the Greek word there. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't let Bacchus in our church door. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? Don't let him in your family's door. Number two, set the buzz guardrail. If you drink to the point that you get a buzz, you've already had one drink too many. Don't even flirt with it. Flee from it. That's why we have the thing, buzz driving is drunk driving. That's the principle. If, if you can't drive home from a dinner date, that's a problem. Your wife shouldn't be driving you around. Next, um, don't, don't seek your comfort from a bottle. The last time you need to take a drink is the last time when you need to take a drink. Don't search after that. Don't go for that southern comfort. You can have it. 
but be wise about it. Number four, in the same way we don't want sexual immorality to even have a hint here among our members. May there not even be a hint, may drunkenness not even be even a hint of drunkenness among us. What are things that give hints that somebody might be getting a buzz? I'm going to give you one, and I'm just I'm, I'm asking you as your pastor, please do this. Don't put pictures like this online. Hey, this is what it takes to have a good time. This is where we find our comfort. Maybe you don't have a problem with it. Remember, one out of two people looking at that social media post, they don't need to go there. Please don't when you're at the beach. Oh, this is the life. They don't know if that's your first or fifth. Let there not even be a hint among you. And then whatever you do, don't post a picture of you looking like this. All right? Like, uh, oh, man, come on. Come on, people. I'm not going to look at anybody in the room right now. Come on, people. All right? I'll, I'll keep going. Just trying to lighten it up a little bit. Principle number five. It's, not, it's good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that calls your brother to stumble. And you don't know which brother's going to stumble. So I'm just going to encourage you, man. Don't try to get somebody to start using a drug that might ruin their lives. Not saying you can't have one, but don't encourage other people. You don't know their story. And as I say that, just remember, if you're out with a group, remember the stats. If you've got six people around the circle, what are the odds? How many of these people are probably going to have a problem? Three. If you're out in a group of six people, what are the odds that one of them is going to become addicted? How many? Probably this one. If you're in a group of 10, one of them, it's probably ruining their life. Life. So let's be considered about how we walk as wise. Number six, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. What am I saying by that? Listen, if you're with a small group or somebody you love, a brother in Christ, love them enough. If they start to take the keys or you see they're getting a buzz, love them enough. Especially like if you're going out and all the time, this is one of the family members I'll talk to last week, it's like someone should have picked up on the clue that every time that they were going out together, the wife was having to drive them home. Love them enough to say, hey, man, you think you, you think you might need to lay off just a little bit? Love them enough. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we do have people here that don't want to shout it from the rooftops, but they've come through on the other side. Jesus has set them free. And you might be here this morning and you're struggling with addiction, let me tell you what, I'm not going to hate on you. I would just love you all the more. And I've got people here at this church who would love, I'm telling you, they would love to help you walk through the process of walking away that which is causing pain and not joy in your life. Do you all follow me, church? Jesus can set you free. A lot of times it's not as easy as just saying a prayer. So when we see in the Bible it says the sun will set you free, there's a process. And there's an assistance that the church needs to give you in finding that freedom. And I'm going to ask you if you will just be wise enough, if you'll be loving enough, if you'll be open enough to let us pastor you and help you find healing for your soul. Let's go to the Lord.